18-year-old Kishindra Hall was just weeks away from a new, exciting chapter in her life when it was all snatched away. But by who and why? Today, we are going to be going into this case in a bit more detail while I sketch two portraits of Kishindra, one at 18 and another age-progressed version. Also known as Clea, she was about to graduate and she seemed destined for success. She was very bright, and when I say bright, I mean whip smart. She was an honor roll student, top of her class, and she was planning the speech that she was scheduled to give at the commencement. In May of 1994, Clea had just attended her senior prom at Watson Chapel High School in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And she was in her final stretch of the after-school job she had, doing clerical work for a man named Larry Amos, who ran a federally funded food program out of his home office not far from her home. After graduation, she was going to attend a leadership conference in Boston, and then she was starting a new job, an internship at a pediatrician's office. She loved children, according to her mom, and she wanted to be a doctor. By the sounds of it, no doubt she would have gone on to become a doctor, given her intelligence and her hard work. She had received a scholarship to Tennessee State University and was going to be entering their pre-med program. But someone with dark intentions had other plans for her. On Monday the 9th of May, she was supposed to work at Larry's house after school. Her mother always dropped her off. On this day, nobody was home, so Clea went to her own home and she napped on the couch until Larry's wife called and she said that she had arrived home so that Clea could come over. Clea's mom drove her and she watched her walk into Larry's home at around 5 p.m. that day. She didn't know it at the time, but this was the last time she would see her daughter. So her mom went home and later she received a call from Clea. It was at around 8 p.m. Clea asked if anyone had called for her, but nobody had. She then told her mom that she had some work to wrap up and she'd call back when she was ready to leave. Her mom was waiting for her call and she ended up falling asleep. Clea always called her mom when she was done with work so that her mom could come pick her up. So her mom knew that the ringing phone would wake her up. But instead, what woke her was her husband coming home from his shift at 12.45 p.m. and asking her where Clea was. So Clea's mom immediately called Larry. Now remember, it's almost 1 a.m. at this point. But Larry picks up on the first ring, and this isn't a cell phone. The chances of you being awake and close enough to a home phone at 1 a.m. to pick up the first ring are very, very slim, in my opinion. Larry tells Clea's mom that she left earlier that day. He said he was going to go check her timesheet and then told her mom that she clocked out at 8.30 p.m. I would personally be very curious to see those timesheets and compare the handwriting. It also seems, in my opinion, that Clea was planning on staying later than 8.30 because why would she call her mother just 30 minutes before leaving? So if it takes her mom, let's say, maximum 10 minutes to get there, that means she would have called her mom again only 20 minutes after the initial phone call to come pick her up. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Her mom said that sometimes she worked until 10.30 p.m. So it's also not like she was supposed to leave at 8 or 8.30 or something and was calling her mom to say she'd be late. Clea's mom was kind of irritated at first that she wasn't home, wondering if she was maybe asserting her independence, but this was very unlike her. She had never done anything like this before. Clea's mom sat up the whole night sick with worry over her daughter. The next morning, Clea did not show up for band practice. Her brother went to look for her when he arrived at school, but she wasn't there. Her family then tried to report her missing at the police station, but the police said that she was legally an adult and they would have to wait 24 hours. And this is unfortunately way too common. The first 24 hours, as we know, are essential. Clea's family frantically called everybody they know, but nobody had heard from her. They then waited until the 24 hours had officially passed and filed a missing persons report. According to the family, police filed the report because they were obligated to, but they were not very motivated to assist in the search. They thought she was a teenager out with friends, but her mom knew better, and of course she did. Parents know their kids. 
She had no reason to run away. She had amazing things lying ahead of her and she was very excited about that. Her identification, purse and other important possessions were also still at her house. Her family then conducted their own search without the police, starting with a wooded area across the street from Larry Amos's house. They found nothing. They also put flyers up everywhere, but they got no leads. If you're wondering where Larry was at this time, he had left town and gone to Texas on business the day after Claire was last seen. And a few days after she had first disappeared, so long past the first 72 hours that we all know are critical, detectives finally started interviewing people close to Claire. A boy who was a close friend of hers took a polygraph test, which was inconclusive, and his car was searched, but nothing was found. I'm not 100% sure that this is the boy in question, but a few weeks before she disappeared, she was dropped off by this boy at Larry's house, and Larry shouted at him and said that he did not permit courting on his property. Which is weird to me, because why are you observing your employees' comings and goings this closely? When Larry finally returned from his business trip, detectives finally then spoke to him. In his initial statement, he said he just heard the garage door close when Claire left. Apparently, she often left through the garage when her mom picked her up because her mom didn't want to honk the horn outside. I don't know the layout of the house, but obviously that makes sense to the people who did. But if someone came to pick her up, how did they know not to honk? Anyway, Larry later changed this version of events and said that he actually saw her get into a car, but he didn't see the driver and he couldn't give any description of the car, not whether it was a truck or a sedan, what color, nothing, which seems a little bit unusual to me personally and seems to be a big deviation from Larry paying very close attention for any courting on his property. A female co-worker also gave a different version of events. She signed out of work at 8.25, so she would have the timesheets to prove that, and she offered to give Claire a lift home. Claire said no, and that she was going to walk home. And this is all a bit bizarre, because firstly, Claire didn't ever walk home, Secondly, if Claire left in someone's car and the co-worker signed out at 8.25 and Claire signed out just five minutes later, would Claire not have been worried that her co-worker would see her leaving in another car and know that she lied? This is also a sticking point for me in my mind. I think about it a lot. If her co-worker understood her correctly and she was making an excuse for not going with the co-worker, why would she do that? Was she trying to hide the connection or relationship she had with the person picking her up? If that's the case, my point about the five minutes and her co-worker possibly spotting her is also important, and that doesn't make sense to me. Was she too uncomfortable with her co-worker to drive with her? Her co-worker was female, and the trip was a short distance away, so that seems unlikely, but I guess it is possible. Is it possible that she was asked to stay behind later, but not to tell her co-workers, Maybe to receive a farewell gift or a bonus payment or something? This is just me asking questions. There is literally no evidence of any of these possibilities being true or not true. Clear had been missing for two weeks before Larry's office was searched. He also refused to take a polygraph. Nothing suspicious was found in his office. There was no sign of a struggle. Then again, it would be two weeks after the hypothetical struggle would have even occurred. Police said that multiple people were there when Claire left. But if that was true, why could not a single person give any description of the vehicle she supposedly got into? Did they personally speak to any of these numerous people? Just a question. Claire was not the type to get into a car with strangers, so police were convinced she left with someone she knew. But it's not clear why that would be their main theory. Why would she have called her mom and said that she would call for a ride when she finished work if she knew she was getting a ride with someone else just 30 minutes later. But then another question for me is, who was she hoping would call for her at home? A boy? There are so many open questions in this case. Claire's parents have never let her case leave people's memories. They still release balloons every year on her birthday. In 2012, two construction workers who had done work in Larry's home in the 90s went to the police 
and said that one of them saw what looked like blood splatter on some insulation panels, and the other said he smelled a funky smell. Police got a search warrant to search the home. They brought in sniffer dogs and radar technology. They removed bags of evidence from the home to submit for tests. But then, some detective at the search, instead of giving the evidence to crime scene technicians, put the bags of evidence in the trunk of his car. He said he did this to avoid the media scrutiny, but then he took the bags home overnight. Were the media chasing you all the way to the police station, buddy? You literally had one job. So basically the evidence was compromised because the chain of custody was messed up. And this is a detective, not some cop on his first day. Claire's family was told the evidence went to the lab for tests, but weeks went by with no updates. Eventually they followed up, only to learn that they had been lied to. The evidence was never sent to the lab. The tests were eventually done, but no blood was found on any of the items. And then the case went cold. Claire's mom is desperate to find out what happened to her daughter, and I can't imagine how angry and frustrated they must be. If you have any information that may be helpful in this case, please call the police. I will leave the number down below as always. That's it for today. Thank you for watching, commenting, liking, subscribing. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next week. Bye.